Okay, I'd like to introduce okay. Rick Ackermans, who is um, with the MVA Broadcast Consulting Group, but he's also chairman of the VSF's RIST Activity Group. And as you can see, RIST stands for Reliable Internet Stream Transport. So this is going beyond the studio and sending streams very reliably over the public internet. Take it away, Rick. Actually, I need the remote. Okay. Hello, everyone. So I'm here to talk about reliable internet stream transport. What is RIST? RIST is a technical recommendation uh, from, for interoperable low latency contribution via the internet. It's, it's being developed by members of the Video Services Forum Reliable Internet Stream Tra Task Force Activity Group. So we're a bunch of people working together, all as equals, trying to figure out how we want this to work. Okay, so RIST is a video service after to define and promote an interoperable technical recommendation for the transport of live, keywords being real-time low latency, video over unmanaged networks, including the internet. The internet, as we all know, is a nasty place. It's not, you know, it has no QoS of any type. You have to deal with congestion. You have to deal with packet loss. It's a very harsh environment for video. The way most of the time people deal with it is buffering and resending. Well, that causes latency. And if you're doing news interviews, that's problematic. So the question is, what can you do to keep the latency down and the quality up? Now, some people will say, there are lots of great products for moving contribution video here at, here at IBC. I just saw a bunch of them out in the halls. I walked around, and I saw a whole bunch of companies doing stuff. And yes, there are a bunch of companies who are doing some really good things. The problem is, most of these devices don't talk to one another. If you've got something from company A, the vast majority of the time, it will not talk to co company B. Now, the industry does not accept uh, non-interoperation from satellite uplinks. You know, we don't have it today where I call company provider A and I've got to have company provider A's downlink equipment. You know, so you've got a breaking news story and a truck rolls out. Oh, I don't have your gear. I need this uplink truck there because the equipment I have is only compatible with that uplink. Well, that doesn't fly. You know, that, that just is not an option for satellites, and we know that. Well, why are we accepting that as an option for Internet streams? We need some level of interoperability like we have with satellites with the, you know, with the DVB standards that we use. So there are currently uh, 22 companies actively involved in, in the risk development. These companies include the folks you can see here, Artel Charter, Cobalt, DVEO, Everts, High Vision, and EOQuest, CenturyLink, uh, Media Transport Solutions, myself, uh, Nevion, Covidium, Sencor, uh, Telecom Pro TV, Turner, VideoFlow, and Zixi, and others who have not given us permission to use their logo. We had a whole thing where we had to get permission. So there are others, but they didn't give us logo permission, so they're not in here. Individuals who have been uh, the primary risk contributors to date, and these are folks who are defined as people who have attended at least 10 meetings th this year, are listed here. I won't read off all the names, but you can see who they are, including this nice gentleman up here um, and, and this nice gentleman over there. But you can... The Risk Activity Group meets Wednesdays from 11 to 12, and we, and we are perfectly willing to have other people join us. We want other people to join us. Additional members are always welcome. The one caveat, though, is you have to be a member of the Video Services Forum to be a member of the Activity Group, which means see that gentleman there in the greenish-blue shirt, or the bluish-green shirt, or whatever color it is. So how is risk development structured? Structured. Structured. The development of RIST has been divided into four parts. RIST will have multiple operational profiles corresponding to increasing levels of complexity and functionality. In other words, we got lazy and decided to do the easy stuff first. Higher profiles will include all the features and functionality of the preceding profiles. Uh, the, now, I'm about to give you a description of the profiles, disclaimer. Uh, the description of profiles 2, 3, and 4 are preliminary as of 18 September 2018 and are likely to undergo changes. Uh, so we've left ourselves open. So just because it's, something's here doesn't mean it's not going to move next week. The only stuff that's firm is profile 1. So profile 1, we're calling the simple profile. 
Profile two is the main profile. Three is enhanced profile. And four is we're calling the scalable profile, or at least we're calling th those of them that now, that may change. So profile one, the simple, uh, um, is covers point-to-point -point unicast, single packet loss recovery, burst loss recovery, network link aggregation, in other words, bonded streams, and redundant transmission paths. Sender features include fixed bit rate coding, user control settings, multiple live unicast destinations, user scalable buffer size, user control settings, and hitless protection switching. So if you take it, so if you have multiple streams going different ways and you lose a packet, you have time to do a resend and send that packet via an alternate path. Now profile, and that, and that exists. We have profile one, the activity group approved the profile a couple of weeks ago. It's going to the video services forum board for approval. And with a little luck, hopefully it'll be published within a couple of weeks. Profile two, this is where we're just getting started. So this is just the template. Uh, point to multi-point unicast, stream encryption, which goes in with something was talked about in the last presentation. Uh, VPN tunneling and NAT transversals, null packet suppression, stream negotiation and auto configuration. Profile one is manual. In-band signaling, forward air correction, negotiated buffer size and and FEC decoding and FEC encoding. You'll see where that comes in later on. Three, variable network bandwidth, common channel uh, session management, centralized DHCP server, adjustable bitrate coding, network bandwidth pro, bandwidth estimation, and adaptive filter. And I'm running through these quicker because they're all preliminary, so don't want to spend too much time on it. And four, scalable profile, 100 megabits or greater, potentially even for uncompressed streams. Uh, we're, we're taking the, the limits off so we could go with some really big streams here. There's no reason that this technology has to be limited to compressed streams, even though that is its primary application. IGM uh, P for IPv4 and MLD for IPv6 for multicasting. Scalable video coding and scalable decoder. So let's take a look at profile one. The, a final draft specification for profile one, simple profile, has been approved by the activity group and is being submitted to the VSF board for approval. We were hoping to have it approved before this, but a bunch of stuff came up, and so it'll be shortly after uh, IBC is over, assuming, assuming the board approves it. One never assumes. Uh, profile draft is referred to as TR06-1, and profile two will be dash two, et cetera, et cetera. And so it will continue to build. Whereas unlike some standards, we're waiting until we're all done, we're releasing this incrementally as we go along so people can see where we are, where we're going, and can start building products if they want to to it because the industry wants this stuff. Profile 1 only deals with transport stream specifications. No video compression codec is specified in Profile 1. Profile 1 provides only basic interoperability and packet loss recovery. All configuration in Profile 1 is manual. So yes, you have to go in and manually configure every parameter there is no auto configuration. We will get to that later. Unicast transmission is used when transmitted over the internet. And RTP is, is used as a baseline protocol for media transport. In order to ensure a level interoperability between RIST and non-RIST implementations, RTP shall be used as a baseline protocol. And I stress for the reason for this. What we're doing with RIST is we're saying that RIST is a, a baseline configuration. We are not saying that if a manufacturer wants to adopt RIST, they can't put other things in their units. We're just saying if you adopt RIST, you have to support RIST, you have to support streams that come from other RIST equipment. But if you've got some secret sauce, so you've got something that's proprietary that's better, and you want to have your own modes, that's fine. We're not saying you can't have other things in the box. We're just saying this is what you have to include for compatibility purposes. Uh, if an RTP standard exists for a certain media type, that standard shall be used to define the RTP header fields. For example, if the media be transported in the format is of the MPEG-2 transport stream, SMPT 2022-1 slash or 2, uh, sh shall be used for the baseline stream. So, you know, we're adapting. If you use a transport and it has specifics, use the specifics for that transport. Which will, au will augment the baseline RTP transmission with a mechanism to recover from packet loss. And feedback control messages shall use RTCP as specified in RFC 3550. 
Now, profile one contains no FEC. This is what some people have said, so you're using FEC. No, we're not using FEC. For internet transmissions with the latency on the internet, many of the participants felt that FEC didn't bring anything to the equation. It's a re resend, if you don't get the packet, ask for it again, and resend it. Um, so with internet latencies, there seems to be a strong opinion among, actually, really wasn't any opposition to it, saying FEC didn't bring anything to the party at this point. If you get into longer latencies, which may happen later when we start looking at like satellite contribution, satellite internet, as more internet go, may go satellite based, going to the internet may not always be just terrestrial fiber. You may have high throughput satellites, whether it's from, you know, Viasat, Inelsat, O3B, that use some level of satellite to create your internet link. Um, that has longer latencies. Profiles dealing with longer latencies may get into your dealings with some FEC because of the re packet resend times. But that, that's later. We, I'm just brainstorming because that's later, which we haven't necessarily gotten to yet. Um, general operation, oh, sorry. Uh, RIS uses NAC-based selective retransmissions protocol to recover from packet loss. The general operation is as follows. One packet, once packet loss is detested, receiver will request a retransmission of the lost packet. So, people say, what's the latency of RIST? It depends on your internet path. If you've got, if you're using stuff truly locally, you're just going across the town, you've got, you know, you've got a ping time of 10, 20 milliseconds, you know, 10 milliseconds or something, you can certainly have, not counting the compression, subframe latency. On the other hand, you're going around the world, you know, you're here and you're trying to ping Australia, where a ping time from here to Australia typically is in the range of 200 plus milliseconds, your latency is going to be at least a minimum of one and a half times that, because you have to allow for the signal to get there, for it not to get there, the request to come back, the resend, and the uh, packet on the second to get there. So the latency will be greater than one and a half times your ping time. Your ping time is really low, your latency can be low. Your ping time is really high, it's going to be higher. If using satellite, obviously much higher. Uh, and packets may be requested multiple times. So if you've got a bad internet connection, you may have to increase your buffers a bit because it may occasionally take a couple tries to get it through. Obviously it's not a good thing, but as I said at the beginning, the internet is a harsh environment. Uh, I didn't put it here in writing, but I've often said the, the baseline test should be uh, can we actually get a signal out of a hotel room at a Marriott? Because, I'm sorry, I've got a thing about Marriott, I'm picking on them, but I've had problems there so many times. That's my, my acid test. Uh, risk senders and receivers shall be implemented. Uh, a min, a min, uh, I'm starting over. Uh, risk senders and receivers shall implement a minimal subset of RTCP. For receivers, RTCP shall be used as a primary request for lost packet retransmission. So that's the format we're using. There's a lot of them out there. That's the one we selected. For senders, RTCP is used primarily to keep a state for NAT devices along the path. For additional information included in the RTCP packet, may be used sender and receiver devices to achieve better network performance. That's how we decided to do it. People have different ideas. Join the group. We're open. Multicast can be used in compatible environments. Now, here I have a contradiction between my roadmap and our reality. So I said the things may change. Well, they sort of change between the beginning of the presentation and the end, and that's because I was, we agreed that I would use our roadmap and I would use Profile 1, and there's actually a little bit of a contradiction between the roadmap and what we do with Profile 1 because we had a users who wanted to use multicast. So we said multicast can be used in compatible environments such as private networks, our network's connected with uh, multicast compatible tunnels, which contradicts with the roadmap that says that Profile 1 is unicast only. Oh, well. Uh, you know, we're a committee. We do things by committee. We try to keep everybody happy. Uh, in a multicast environment, the RIST will uh, follow the standard UDP port assignments as per RFC 3550. Feedback and control messages shall use RTCP as uh, specified in RFC 3550. RISC Simple Profile supports bonding of multiple transmission channels, such as Wi-Fi, LTE, et cetera. An, indiv oh, sorry. An individual RTP media stream can be split between multiple channels in order to combine their bandwidths. 
An individual RTP media stream can be replicated between multiple channels in order to increase their reliability. It's the internet, you do what you can. Both techniques can be used simultaneously. In these cases, receivers will need to combine the packets in order to reconstruct the original media stream. So, does it work? We've, we've done a little experiment here, or actually, Ciro there has done a little experiment. We took um, six of our providers, and actually seven of our providers, and we said, can we do this live here at the show? So we took feeds from these various locations, and we fed them all to an unnamed vendor named Cobalt in Champaign, Illinois, who aggregated all the streams together, put them on a multi-viewer, and live sent them back here to us at, uh, at the Rye. And this is a still capture. In a second, I've got a, a real-time one that I can show of what has been shown on many, at many of the booths here at the show. If you look at the real one, it actually moves, but this has to be embedded in a PowerPoint. And here it is on display live in multiple booths. Here we have it at Cobalt and Nevion and Video Flow and DVEO. And this ran the whole show, no, no real problems. And so we had the, the multiple images from these vendors and even the Cobalt one came from one Cobalt location to another. So this is a still capture, I can show you on my tablet here, the real time one, uh, of all these streaming live from it back to Champagne, from Champagne back here, and it, it worked. It's worked very reliably for, for the whole show. Okay, so here it is, live. This is off the internet. And these are all the same vendors you saw. Actually, let me back this up for one second. Same thing you saw up there, but this is the actual Rick live. Yeah. And it, it, it works. Um, it is profile one. It is manually configured. It is using decent internet. You know, we have not gotten into, I will admit, if you've got cruddy internet, you know, but then there's what, a lot of people have 5% packet loss. Yeah, a lot of people are actually generating 5% packet loss just to show that the retransmission works. So m many of these little cells in here, people are 5% loss before it, even, before it even leaves the building. And so the retransmission does work. And, you know, wrist with reasonable internet does work. And hopefully as we advance it and we put automation in there and the ability to automatically configure, we'll get it to the point that it works well on crummy internet. We up to what latency? That's the key. So obviously, if you, you know the old saying, while not true, you know, buff buffering solves all problems. Not totally true, but not totally false either. Um, so eventually we'll get to the point that it will be as low a latency as possible, but if it starts taking hits, it may have to increase the buffer on the receive side, increase the latency, just to have enough time to get that packet through. So it all, it, it all depends on the quality of your internet. That's, that's the issue with the internet. There's no QoS. So you are completely at the mercy of that link. If, and if there's no bits coming through, there's nothing anybody can do. You know, if the internet has totally fallen over because, you know, there's just not enough bandwidth and, you know, you, you do a speed test and you find you're getting 20 uh, kilobits per second, you're not going to do much. Yeah, maybe it'll, maybe it'll fall over to telephone quality audio for really good about it. Sir. Just a data point, if you do four retries, you allow yourself four, four retries, you can usually run this thing to 20% packet loss, it still works. Uh, you've shown several paths. Which ones are native multicast, not over tunnels? Which ones are native? Yeah. Well, well, none of them are. These are these are all unic. What's up here? These are all unicast. All unicast, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We the the multicast that we are allowing in Profile One is strictly on a private network, uh, and that was originally we said we didn't want to deal with multicast at all, but we had a couple of vendors who, on WANs, 
you know, on not the internet, but on WANs wanted to support multicast. Obviously, the internet with IPv4 does not support multicast. Okay, what, what is the prospect in the future uh, of maybe IPv6 multicast and ISP supporting it? IPv6 is supposed to support it. Now, when things moved to IPv6, well, actually, the last date I heard for I, everybody moving to IPv6 was, what, 2011? At one point, we were told, one point we were told, everybody's going to have to be IPv6, but 2010 is the end of IPv4. By 2011, you better be IPv6. Well, it's 2018 now, and so I'm not handicapping that one anymore. <laughs>